And now, let us get started. It is my great pleasure to hand over the stage to the Chairman of the European Insurance and Occupational Pensions Authority, Gabriel Bernardino. Welcome. The floor is yours. Nice to see you. So good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much, M Melinda, for uh, the presentation. It's always a pleasure to have you as our moderator. You know, we have for sure your charm guiding us through all the day. So it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you, of course, to this year's uh, AOPA annual conference. And in particular, it's of course my pleasure to welcome our distinguished uh, speakers and panelists. The theme of uh, this year's conference is insurance and pensions securing the future. And what do we mean by that? Well, exactly what we say. Insurance and pensions are sectors where you need to invest short-term, but outcomes are long-term. As consumers, we put money into our, into our pension products to secure our, our future retirement. We buy insurance policies to protect ourselves against future rainy days. In an age where instant gratification is more the norm, setting aside money for the future takes indeed some trust and commitment. And that's where we come all. Providers need to earn the trust of people to invest in their products or rely in their services. Regulators need to develop sound and prudent set of rules and principles to be followed. Supervisors need to ensure that these rules are applied and that they deliver appropriate consumer protection and market stability. Providers, regulators, and supervisors are then crucial for trust. It can take a lifetime to build trust, but as we have abundant evidence, it can go in a flash. So we're talking a lot, of course, along uh, today's event on long term. But of course, we are here today, this, this day, uh, to touch on many different aspects on how are we securing our future. How are we enabling for good supervision and sustainable finance? How are we managing new threats and opportunities so that we, so that we can ensure good outcomes for people, for businesses, and for economies? So I'm very much looking forward to a day of interesting debate and great interventions from our speakers, panelists, and also you, our distinguished audience. In my intervention today, I will touch on three main areas covering AOPA's achievements and priorities uh, over the past and coming year. First, Solvency II and its review. Second, achieving supervisory convergence. And third, working for consumers. I will finalize by touching on our future, looking ahead to some of the challenges and opportunities that we face. Coming to my first point, Solvency II and its review. Every year I stand up here and talk to you about Solvency II, and this year is no exception, of course. This is because Solvency II has been, without doubt, one of the biggest changes, if not the biggest change, to the European regulatory framework over the past few years. Moreover, it has been a change for good. In the almost three years since its implementation, the insurance industry has better aligned capital to the risks it runs, uses a risk-based approach to assess and mitigate risks, meaning that, of course, it can better price them. Insurers have significantly strengthened their governance models and their risk management capacity, putting a number of key functions into place and ensuring that boards consider risk and capital factors in their strategic decision making. With Solvency II, insurers throughout Europe use now harmonized templates for supervisory reporting instead of a patchwork of national templates and publicly disclose much more relevant information and by that, of course, creating the basis for market discipline. This is indeed a big step towards greater transparency. In short, Solvency II has helped to strengthen the position of insurers and consumers across Europe. But good regulation is only as good as it remains relevant. It must remain fit and proper if it is to continue to achieve the fundamental objectives of policyholder protection and market stability. And as we all know, the insurance landscape is evolving rapidly. Business models are evolving to make use of more advanced technologies. New risks are emerging, not least in the area of climate change, 
and of course the importance of sustainable finance continues to grow. Therefore, Solvency II must also evolve. We're now reviewing the Solvency II regime to ensure that it remains effective in terms of both its principles and its implementation. We are reviewing it so that we can secure its future. Early this year, we advised the European Commission on possible target adjustments to the regime with concrete recommendations to reduce complexity, increase proportionality, remove some technical inconsistencies, and make corrections where necessary. We proposed a series of new simplifications and proportionate treatments. We adjusted the risk calibrations where new evidence has emerged. We proposed a series of common principles for the calculation of the loss absorbing capacity of deferred taxes, an area where we observe material differences in the implementation in different member states. We also proposed the adjustment of the treatment of interest rate risk because the current method clearly underestimates the risk. We are happy to see that the European Commission has taken most of our advice into account in their draft delegated acts. Nevertheless, I regret the decision to postpone to 2020 the review of the treatment of the interest rate risk. And in that context, let me be clear, I would expect that a similar type of decision is taken regarding other areas like the treatment of equity risk and the risk margin. Regarding the 2020 review, AOPA believes in evolution, not in revolution. Solvency II should adapt to the new market conditions without fundamentally changing the basic principles of the risk-based regime. At AOPA, we are already working on a number of areas. The long-term guarantee measures, as it is defined in the directive, the treatment of long-term illiquid insurance liabilities and the assets that are backing them, the reporting and public disclosure requirements, the supervisory tools and measures that are needed to reinforce the macroprudential nature of Solvency II, and finally, the way that sustainability should be considered in the regime. All these analyses will be, of course, taken into consideration the fundamental element of proportionality. On the long-term guarantee measures, we will revisit their design and calibration in light of the experience collected. These measures have an important impact on the financial position of insurers, and they also have a relevant financial stability implication. I believe that it is possible to fine-tune them to ensure that they will continue to work properly under different market conditions, and that's what we're going to do. On illiquid liabilities, you remember last year, around more or less this time, I mentioned that we would start to do some work and explore this area. I'm happy to say that we just published a discussion paper. The illiquidity characteristics of liabilities may indeed contribute to the ability of insurers to mitigate short-term volatility by holding assets throughout the duration of the commitments, even in terms of micro market stress. We are particularly interested on how the short and long-term risks of long-term investments relate to the potential illiquid characteristics of liabilities. AOPA will further assess whether the risks connected to illiquid liabilities and the assets covering them are adequately reflected in the current regulatory regime. This analysis will include an assessment of any unintended consequences of the current regulatory treatment and how such consequences could be mitigated. As I mentioned, proportionality will be a key word in the 2020 evaluation and specifically on the reporting and public disclosure requirements. The embedded proportionality included in the current design of the reporting requirements delivers appropriate relief to European insurers. Our analysis showed that, for example, only 21% of the undertakings throughout Europe report the look-through template for investments in collective undertakings. And only 26% report on the derivatives templates. So the embedded proportionality indeed works. AOP is open to explore other meaningful ways to increase proportionality and reduce the burden to firms in line with the nature, scale, and complexity of their business. For example, that could be the concrete case of certain types of captives. Regarding the public disclosure, namely the Solvency and Financial Condition Report, 
Streamline and standardized should be the keywords. The SFCR was a paradigm shift in the transparency of the insurance sector, and we need to keep it. The feedback that we receive from investors, analysts, and consumer associations confirms the relevance of this tool for market discipline. But it also identifies possibilities to streamline it in some areas, to obtain more comprehensive and better structured information on the risk sensitivity to different scenarios or stresses, together, more importantly, I would say, with more standardized information on the sources of changes in the home funds and the solvency capital requirement. We will follow this feedback that we are receiving. Following our work on systemic risk and macro potential policy in insurance, AOP intends to present concrete proposals on how to integrate some additional macro potential tools in Solvency II to enhance the capacity of supervisors to monitor and intervene preventively. Enhanced reporting and monitoring tools need to be designed to ensure that supervisors early identify potential systemic risks and vulnerabilities that are or could be building up in the system in relation to capital reserving, liquidity, and asset and liability exposures. Furthermore, clear intervention powers should be available to be used in the hopefully rare circumstances where the other measures may not suffice to address the sources of systemic risk. For example, limits or restrictions or the imposition of a capital add-on for systemic risk purposes. These tools and measures should build up, should complement and should be consistent with the Solvency II framework in order to avoid different incentives for insurers' risk management. Well-tailored, calibrated, and proportionate macroprudential measures should contribute to mitigate systemic risk by ensuring sufficient loss-absorbing capacity, discouraging excessive levels of direct or indirect concentrations, and overall limit procyclicality. And I'm very happy that the work that AOPA has been doing in this area is also having an important impact in the developments at the international side in the work that is being done on systemic risk and the activities-based approach. We have quite, I would say, a consistent uh, framework being developed both internationally and at European level. Finally, in the context of sustainable finance agenda, EOPA is already working on the way that environmental, social, and governance risks and factors should be integrated in the three pillars of Solvency II. First and foremost, we believe that insurers should include in their risk management system processes to identify, measure, manage the ESG risks. This is the fundamental element. Regarding capital requirements, the debate is only starting. But in my view, any reorientation of capital flows should arise because insurers take a long-term approach, including a view of sustainability over a long-term horizon, and not because of regulatory incentives. On disclosure, reliable information on insurers' exposures to ESG risks will, of course, strengthen transparency and the stability of the financial system. Let me now touch on my second point, achieving supervisory convergence. Last week, the European Court of Auditors published this special report on AOPA's contribution to supervision and stability in the insurance sector. We welcome the publication of the report, in particular the recognition of our important contribution to a common supervisory culture and financial stability in the insurance sector. And I'm honored that uh, Mr. Rimantas Saudius, member of the, of the court, has joined us uh, today. Ensuring high quality and consistent supervision is fundamental to the proper function of the internal market. And this is one of the reasons why supervisory convergence is our highest priority. We have been working closely with national authorities to foster a common European supervisory culture since their inception, and we will continue to do so. This is a marathon, not a 100-meter race. Last year, we outlined the key characteristics of a common European supervisory culture. This year, we published our supervisory convergence plan for 2018-2019, in which we identify three main areas of action. The further development of common supervisory tools and benchmarks, the supervision of cross-border business, looking in particular to any possibilities of supervisory arbitrage, 
and thirdly, the supervision of emerging risks. As the European Court of Auditors recognized, we have made good use of a wide range of tools to support supervisory convergence, but these require further development. As part of our supervisory convergence plan, we will focus on tools and benchmarks related to the application of proportionality, the supervision of internal models, and very importantly, on the supervisory assessment of conduct risks. We hope to publish soon um, an opinion from AOPA focusing on a particular issue of the French construction business with clear recommendations uh, to uh, the providers and to the supervisory authorities on the way to build sound technical provisions in this business. And in the coming weeks, I hope to be also possible to publish a framework on the way that uh, supervisors can implement a sound assessment of conduct risks, an element that I found uh, very, very important. So we are definitely implementing what we promised in this supervisory convergence plan. Cross-border business is an asset of the single market, and it is supposed to deliver benefits for competition and also for consumers. But to achieve this, strong supervision is required. In this field, our priorities for the coming year will look at the detection of uh, unsustainable cross-border business models, to the sufficiency of technical provisions, and to the fit and proper analysis. We are also aware of emerging risks. Securing the future means being able to mitigate both existing and emerging risks. In the immediate term, we are examining supervisory practices related to IT resilience and cyber risks, the usage of big data, and of course, Brexit. A particularly important tool in the supervisory convergence area have been the development of cooperation platforms. In these platforms, AOPA joins together with home and host supervisors to look at concrete cases of companies with cross-border activities and their supervision. To date, AOP has coordinated 13 platforms involving national supervisors from many different countries. For each platform, AOPA provided concrete recommendations to the home supervisor. In some instances, these recommendations were aimed to strongly encourage the home supervisor to initiate some intrusive interventions towards firms such as prohibiting new, the writing of new business in order to limit the risk to prospective policyholders. The business models of these companies that have been subject to cooperation platforms differ significantly from motor insurance, French construction business, as I mentioned, medical malpractice, and also complex unit link structures. In general, the focus of these companies is on grow, growth outside of the home market and on long-tail business where the risk will only materialize on the medium to long term. Usually there are deficiencies in the data available, insufficiencies in technical provisions, and also complex intermediation structures. And the impact of failure of such companies can cause significant waves in the host markets, severely disrupting public trust in the functioning of the internal market. We need to confront this seriously. But also the supervision and enforcement of the new conduct of business requirements is essential to ensure the desired increase in consumer protection. It is our expectation at AOPA that all the national competent authorities reinforce their market monitoring activities, deepen their knowledge about the products sold in their markets, and effectively take supervisory measures to stop eventual bad practices. It is time to take conduct of business supervision more seriously. For AOPA, both prudential and conduct of business supervision are an integral part of consumer protection mandate. With the solvency to implementation, AOPA and the national authorities have put in place a number of activities in order to ensure a high degree of consistency of prudential supervision throughout the EU. There is a long way to go in order to ensure that consumers in different member states benefit from an attentive and effective conduct of business supervision. For that, we need more and better resources to be focused on conduct of business supervision. And we also need a cultural change in supervisory authorities to indeed attribute sufficient attention to this area. Overall, the focus of supervisory convergence activities by EOPA is also reflected in a number of growing number of peer reviews, mediation cases, and breach of union law investigations. At the same time, let me be frank, 
These activities have also shown the limitations of current EOPA's powers. And that's why we have been advocating for concrete amendments to the EOPA regulation to build a stronger framework for EOPA's independent assessment of supervisory practices and also to enhance preventive tools regarding cross-border business. In, regard, in this regard, we fully agree with the recommendations of the European Court of Auditors to strengthen our powers through the ongoing review of the three European supervisory authorities known as the ESA's review so that we can act more intrusively when and where we detect signs of cross-border failure. So I have talked a lot about regulation and supervision. For us, these are, of course, day-to-day -day topics. But these are only tools to achieve our main objective, which is consumer protection. So that brings me to my third point, working for consumers. For consumers, much of our work is intangible. Companies are supervised, crises are minimized, risks are mini mitigated, and consumers, for the most part, they are untouched. But more and more consumers are seeing the evidence of our work in their daily financial lives, especially through the information that they receive from providers. Under the Insurance Distribution Directive, the IDD, we have seen the introduction of the Insurance Product Information Document, the IPID. This document provides customers with standardized information about non-life insurance products in a short, standalone, and easy-to-read document that allows customers to better compare products and make informed decisions. This document was developed on the basis of extensive research with consumers of various ages and levels of financial literacy. The result is a document in which the key features of non-life insurance products are presented in a simple and easy-to-understand question and answers format without technical jargon. The IPID is eye-catching because it's uses of colors and icons. The proposed design also takes into account how information is presented by a digital media. For instance, by allowing the layout of information using pop-ups to adjust to the small screen of our mobile phones. In terms of practical experience so far with the IPID at national level, we have received a lot of positive feedback. A number of existing national product information documents were considered too long, lots of text, and some confusing messages to consumers. What the IPID has brought is more comparable and clear information for the customer based on its standardized design. Another example of our work to improve the experience of consumers when engaging with insurers and distributors is the KID, the key information document on the PRIPS. And this, is, of course, is a polemic area. We believe that the PRIPS kit is a step forward regarding the standardization of relevant information to consumers of investment products. At the same time, we are also attentive to some of the concerns raised in its implementation. We recently launched a process to make very targeted changes to the kit. And we also see benefit in limiting the delay to a wider review of the PRIPS that was due to take place this year. Furthermore, we believe it is critical that the same rules apply across all types of package investment products, including usage, to achieve an aim of comparability and avoid consumers receiving different types of information. On the occupational pension sector, EOPA recently published guidance on the implementation of IOP2 in relation to the pension benefit statement, a really important pillar of the provision of pension information. The pension benefit statement main goal is to provide important information such as the current situation of the pension scheme member regarding the accrual of pension benefits, projecting of uh, future retirement benefits to enable retirement planning and help the members to take informed decisions. IOP identified a number of guiding principles for the design and cont content of the pension benefit statement. It should be based on the behavioral approach to facilitate members' decisions about their retirement savings. The information should be layered to help the member to find key information at a glance and to navigate easily through the content and to find answers to the questions. AOPA will continue to promote consistent practices at national level, including the development of examples of standardized designs to this pension benefit statement. But let me be also clear, going forward, it should be our priority to ensure that consumers are not overloaded with information which they do not understand and they do not use. A deep analysis of the current disclosure requirements in place for insurance and pension products 
in the different parts of the European legislation is needed in order to streamline it, to eliminate duplications, to layer the information, and to make sure that the result is ready for the digital economy. This should ensure that simpler, more targeted, and more standardized information is offered to consumers, and this will also, I would say, in, in some way limit the burden to the industry. Now, all this information that is provided to consumers, you know, I won't say that uh, either the, the iPad or the kid make uh, choosing a financial product as easy as a child's play. I won't say that this girl that you see uh, here standing by me um, would ever pick one of these documents and read it with interest. We know it. But I will say that for her parents, these documents will probably make their financial lives and their financial choices are easier. Where this girl will benefit, although probably she doesn't know it yet, it's through the PEP. Imagine the life of this young girl. Here we see her dreaming of her future. Will she learn to fly? Will she be a pilot? Will she be an astronaut? We don't know. But what we do know is that over the course of her lifetime, she will probably hold several jobs. She will possibly move different cities, different countries for work. She will def definitely want a safe and secure source of income when she will stop working. With PEP, hopefully consumers will have a simple, safe and transparent, cost-effective long-term retirement product to complement national systems, adding a default opportunity to save for future retirement within a personal European pension framework. With the PEP, we can have smart portability to adapt to changes in labor markets so that mobile workers will be able to pay into the same product when moving within the European Union. With PEP, we are providing a level playing field for providers, encouraging competition and increasing consumer choice. However, PEP will only be successful if it is trusted, if she will trust in PEP. As a European supervisory authority, I firmly believe that AOPA can ensure the consistency high standards throughout Europe. In this regard, a central certification hub and a key contact point for assessing information on the PEP are crucial for its success. I'm confident that the political trialogues will be successful and that an agreement on the PEP will be found before the end of the current European Parliament mandate. Let's be honest, the PEP is the most important element in the capital markets union. We need to get there. I think it's at our range, and politically I think that this should be taken as a priority. I will finalize touching on our future, looking ahead in some of the challenges, and I will touch on three areas. First, digitalization. Secondly, about sustainable finance, and finally, last but not least, Brexit. On digitalization, we are finalizing, of course, our thematic review on big data. We will come soon uh, with the conclusions from that. And going forward, we will focus on three main elements, ethical standards, algorithms, and technological platforms. We will continue the close dialogue with market participants, both incumbents and startups, consumer representatives, academia, data protection experts, in order to early identify regulatory barriers to innovation but also to contribute to the necessary societal and regulatory debate about the appropriate ethical standards to be used by insurers dealing with big data. Also on the algorithms, we'll be very attentive to make sure that, of course, these are not black boxes. Furthermore, our priority will be given to the analysis of the fragmentation of the insurance value chain and the corresponding impact on business models. We'll need to be very attentive to the emergence of business models where the insurance value chain is originated and managed by technological platforms and find appropriate answers on how to supervise this kind of inverted outsourcing model. Increasing digitalization coupled with the growing number of cyber incidents has of course made cyber risk a major concern for all of us. To enhance the understanding of cyber risk underwriting in the European insurance market, we have undertook a structured dialogue with insurance companies and we published recently a report on, on understanding cyber insurance. 
A questionnaire on cyber risk has been included in this year's stress test for the insurance sector. And next year, for the pension uh, stress test, we want to, of course, touch upon new risks uh, definitely linked to digitalization and sustainability. Let me touch then on sustainability. Of course, sustainability has been at long, I would say, at the heart of the European project. Following the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and the United Nations Agenda for Sustainable Development, the Commission has published this year the Action Plan on Financing Sustainable Growth. This step was, in my view, a truly act of leadership, a vision that should inspire and motivate all of us to contribute to a more sustainable world. The success of the sustainability agenda will depend, in my view, to a great extent on the capacity of financial market participants, including insurance and pension funds, to incorporate into today's risk measurement and decision-making processes the expected long-term consequences of climate change, resource depletion, environmental degradation, as well as social and governance elements. This will be certainly challenging for all market players, but for insurers and pension funds, it is essential. They need to consider physical and transition risks because their business models are based in the liabilities and corresponding assets with time horizons of several decades. So for insurers and pension funds, the inclusion of ESG risks and factors in their risk management systems should not be a consequence of a political or a regulatory imposition. It should be a responsible business practice. And that's why we see more and more insurers and pension funds taking important decisions in their investment and underwriting policies in line with their ESG risk assessment. This is a responsible business practice. And by the way, it, is also, it should also be good for business. Insurers and pension funds, as big institutional investors, should use their stewardship role to engage with companies in which they invest, incentivizing them to take concrete steps towards a lower carbon footprint. This will ensure that the necessary transition to a lower carbon economy is done in a gradual and stable way avoiding any financial stability incidents and also avoiding the emergency of pockets of stranded assets. Furthermore, insurers should use a similar approach in their underwriting activities, incentivizing risk reduction through adequate risk-based pricing. The recent report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change highlights the rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented change needed to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. As rising temperatures accelerate sea level rise and catalyze extreme weather events, communities, businesses, cities and countries are facing new types and higher levels of risk. Insurers and pension funds should act in the best interest of their clients, in the best interest of their policyholders, their members and beneficiaries. And so they should be part of the solution. And that is something that we will be very keen to engage with and to make sure that that's the way that we drive also the business. Finally, on Brexit. I've been very clear since, uh, I would say, many, many months on passing the message, hope for the better, prepare for the worst. And that's, of course, uh, what we have been trying uh, together, of course, with the supervisors and the industry to have, be prepared for contingency. Our latest focus, as you know, has been on contract and service continuity. And let me say that based on the data collected through the monitoring of the Brexit contingency planning of insurance undertakings, and in particular, of course, the undertakings coming from the United Kingdom with cross-border business in the remaining European countries, and due to the nature and scale of this business, we believe, in it's our assessment, that the service continuity issue does not give rise to financial stability risks. But at the same time, we are conscious, of course, of the issues from a consumer protection perspective, and we are working with national competent authorities, addressing the residual risk in order to ensure that customers will be protected. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come far in the insurance and pension sector to secure the future. At EOPA, the only thing I can promise you is that we will continue to be 
open to the dialogue, transparent, but also firm in proceeding our views and our objectives. We will continue to learn from the past, acting in the, pre in the present in order to secure the future. Thank you very much.